Um, we are here for Testing the Wild by Heather Williams. Um, Heather works for Siavula Education. Uh, she's been working in Python for five years, two, two and a half being in testing. And she loves panda bears. So uh, without further ado, please take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. As has already been said, I'm Heather Williams, and I'm talking about testing in the wild today. So I'm a full stack developer in addition to having a passion for testing. And Siavula Education is a maths and science practice service for high school learners. I'm just going to quickly demonstrate the site so that you can see what it's all about. So learners can come to this website. They don't even need a computer or a smartphone. They can even just use a normal mobile phone and they can choose to practice maths or science. They can see some statistics on how many exercises they've been doing, how many atoms they've collected, which is a way of measuring their success. And then they can choose from a table of contents showing them what sections they would like to practice and how well they're doing in it based on how many stars they've collected. So one of the Example questions would be asking them to simplify an equation or an expression, not an equation. And they have to figure out what the answer is, put in the answer, and they see an instant solution to, their, to the question that they were trying to work with. So this, uh, you might be wondering why I've just shown you that. It will come relevant just now when I start showing you real-life coding examples from the service. So first thing is, what is testing? Well, in a nutshell, it's a way of ensuring that your code will always work. It's a way of making sure that no matter what you do, you're really going to actually have buggy code. So why are we out in the wild rather than somewhere nice and tame like this lovely venue? Well, currently, we're going in our day-to-day -day jobs, we're out of the classroom context, and we're in the real world where we actually don't have well-defined problems. We've got often unique problems or new problems that you wouldn't have found from a professor in a computer science lecturer. So why am I going to be picking on TDD in this particular talk or test-driven development? Well, this is just one of the hottest topics in testing at the moment, particularly because of the agile development methodologies that have come along. So why do we even bother with testing? Without testing, things go extremely wrong. There have been cases where a plane has been flying along, fortunately in a simulator, and as soon as the plane crossed the equator, it suddenly flipped upside down. Now, this could be a really bad thing if you're in a passenger jet. You don't want your plane flipping upside down on the equator. There's been other incidents where ships have crossed the international dateline and suddenly stopped dead. Again, we don't really want our ships to suddenly stop in out there in the middle of the ocean. We want them to be keeping on going. Another case was one of the Mars probes that went and crashed into Mars because of a mistake in units. If there'd been sufficient proper testing, that might have been caught in time. But for most of us, we're not working in such high-pressure environments, and so the most that is going to happen is we're just going to have very upset customers. And when your customers get upset with you, they stop buying your product and your company can go under. That's not a good thing for you because you're out of a job. So another reason to test it all. So what can often happen in our dev day-to-day -day work, we might get Bob from marketing coming to us on Thursday and saying, we've got this feature, it has to be out on Monday. There's no other way around it. So you frantically code and you frantically code and you spend the entire weekend and you ship out a feature on Monday morning and it's full of bugs. And Bob is now upset with you, the customers are upset at you, you're upset because you've spent the weekend making buggy code and now you can't get some rest because you've got to keep fixing it. But this, this scenario does often happen and the one way that we can work around it is to push back and say, no, we need time to write tests whether we're going to use TDD to write those tests or writing the tests in some other means, we need to tell Bob that his feature is going to be delayed by half a day so that we have that time to write the tests so that when we start coding when we're very tired, we don't add new bugs to our code 
we're able to catch those bugs before this feature gets out <coughs> into production. So then there are a huge array of types of testing. The most common one that most of you will have encountered is unit testing. Can I get a show of hands who has ever actually done any unit testing? Okay, that's pretty much everyone in the room. Some of the other types you're likely to have encountered is some things like functional tests and stress tests. Functional tests are where we test in your entire system. Stress testing is when you're trying to find where your system might fail when you put a lot of load at it or you're trying to run it in high performance. And then there's all sorts of other tests that depend precisely on what you're trying to do. So this particular talk is going to focus on unit testing because that's the easiest place to start with figuring out how to test. There's a variety of testing methods. You can either test before you start writing the code or testing after you write the code. For testing before you write in the code, it's test-driven development. The focus is now on the tests and you'll be writing these tests in some sort of programming language. It's quite a, it can sometimes be quite a difficult method to figure out, but once you get in the hang of it, it can be a really good method to help you get into the testing mindset. Extended off of TDD is behavior-driven development. This is usually written in some sort of natural language. It will often be English-like, but with a lot of jargon, and the focus is on behaviors. So someone external to the dev environment will come along and say, as a user, I need to be able to sign into this brand new site that we've created. Encapsulated in that statement, so that will be used in a, as an acceptance test, and then from there, you will have to write some further tests, which is usually where the TDD part of it comes in. You can also write tests after development. In this case, the testing is mo the, it's mostly focused on code. Your tests will still be written in a programming language, and you write the code and then you write the test. But this is a very dangerous method to go with because tests will often fall by the wayside. You can also get false positives in your test where you think it's passing and it's actually not really testing what you think it is. So I would really only recommend doing TFD once you've practiced TDD a little bit, got your hands dirty with testing and got into that whole mindset that tests are really important and then you'll be a much better position to test after development. The other kind that is likely to crop up quite a lot for us is test-driven refactoring. Now, test-driven refactoring, you write a whole batch of tests or you extend existing tests and then you can safely go and refactor the code. The focus here is on precisely what your code is doing at all times because you don't want to take legacy code and go and refactor it and introduce a whole lot of new unexpected bugs into the code. You want to know precisely what that code is doing and that is why you test and then you refactor. So, some unit tests. Just what is a unit test? Well, it's testing how one unit of code behaves, which seems like an extremely simple example, but what exactly is a unit of code? Now, usually when you're working with code, it might be a method within a class. It might just be a function sitting on its own. If your method, if you're starting to test more than one method, you're probably not doing unit tests. So to highlight an example, we might have a function that takes in some sort of description of an animal and returns what kind of animal it is. So one unit of code would be testing, do we have a gorilla, a bat, or a panda? And alternatively, we might have a whole class called mammal, and within that class, we have subclasses for each of the types of mammals, and then we would be testing, does my gorilla smile? Can the bat stick out its tongue? Does the panda lie nicely in its tree? So that, those would be examples of units within the code. And this, I think, is one of the hardest pieces to grasp with unit testing, is just figuring out precisely what that unit is. And for me, it's something that's only come with some experience You've got to keep trying and sometimes fail, and then you realize what the unit of code actually is that you need to test. So TDD is a software development method. You write the test, you write the code. It's meant to be used with short development cycles. It's not a particularly new method. It's been known since the 90s and recently has been rediscovered or brought into its own by the Agile, by the agile community and Agile development. 
There's many, many links on the web. These are just two samples. And don't worry, these slides will apparently be up on slide deck, so you'll be able to see these two particular examples. But when you go and search for TDD, you find loads of possible things, things that can go wrong with it, things that can go right, people talking passionately about it, people hating on it. It's a huge topic. So before we can understand where TDD itself will fail, so that we, know, we need to know where the failures in testing are, because once we know where the failures are, we know how to avoid them. So one of the biggest failures for testing is if there's no buy-in. If your entire company, <coughs> right from the CEO down to the lowliest person, doesn't believe that testing is necessary, marketing and sales will keep pushing you for new features without realizing you need this time to test. Your clients will not understand that dev cycles are going to take longer. They'll get their new features just that little bit later because they don't realize there's this need for testing. So you need to be able to go back and communicate to the rest of your company even the non-dev te or technical people, and say, we have to test because we want non-buggy code. And that's the thing you push at them, non-buggy code. Everyone wants non-buggy code. So testing will also fail when you just throw some tests together. When you don't actually think through your tests, when you just finish something up and you're like, oh, I need to add some tests, and you put some tests in there, you need to actually take some time and care for tests. So TDD fails in a few cases. It can fail when you're trying to test more than just one unit because then you start focusing too much on the tests. You start thinking, I have to do all these tests and you write in all these tests and you never actually get to write the code. And when you start writing the code, you end up with these mammoth functions because now you're trying to make your test pass. So you need to keep focusing on just those little bits of code. There's a fair amount of debate over how well you defined your requirements need to be for TDD. But my experience has shown that the fuzzier your requirements are, the harder it is going to be to do TDD. This is because if you don't know what you're doing, how can you write tests to tell what you're doing? Other people will say, no, 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 it's fine. You can use the test to discover what you're going to be doing. If you're, also, if you're working with legacy code, you should probably actually be doing test-driven refactoring before trying to do TDD, because TDD is mainly meant to be used with new features. Even if those features have been added onto the existing code, you can't just go and apply TDD to existing code. Things like machine learning code and all this data science stuff that's now a big hot topic, and stuff like robotics will also be very hard to use TDD with because they tend to need, like machine learning will need simulators and all sorts of things like that rather than focusing on these little units. And as an inc incidental little point to note, the video game industry believes that they have sufficient best practices in place that they don't need TDD. So how do we actually write and run a test with the TDD way? We write our test. We run it, and we see that it fails. We make some code that will make that test pass, and then we keep repeating until we have built up the code that we need. So practical example, as I said, this is now where you'll see why I showed you the site. On our website, we want to know how many users are practicing at any one time. So we have a little widget, which gives us this number, say, 170 people at the time I took the screenshot. The requirements for this are very clear. You know that you need a number between zero and infinity. <coughs> it's probably going to be an integer because you're not likely to have six and a half people practicing. And it's probably not going to be a negative number because minus five people practicing does not make sense. So you write the tests to take the information about how many users are active and you return that information. Simple to do and fairly easy. So I write my tests in unit test and then run them with nose tests. Nose test just helps you a lot with discovering how, where your tests are. So you don't have to always tell it where to find the tests. It can discover them. So the first thing we do is we import unit test. We bring in the test in counter. And we assert, first of all, we're just going to do, if we've got zero users, what is going to happen? 
So we run the tests, and I run my test with red nose and with velocity of two, so I can get some very good output. So I know now that something failed. And this is a very expected failure because I haven't written any module named counter yet. If at this point I did not get this particular failure, I would know a module named counter existed, and I would then go and look and find that module and see if it was doing what I needed it to do or if it needed to be extended. So when you see no module found as your very first test failure, that's a good thing because that's what you want. So then we go and write our very first piece of code. It's extremely simplistic. We're just going to define the counter, define the function user count, and pass. This will now make sure that our test fails instead of can't find a module. So this now verifies that, yes, we have set up things correctly. We haven't forgotten something in an init, init file. We've got everything correctly linked together, and Python can actually find this module. We expect it to fail because we said pass, that returns none, and so we get none not equal to no people. This is entirely expected. So I update my function. And at this point, I decide, OK, I'm just going to return n. I've tweaked my test slightly at this point just to say I'm expecting 0. And there we go. My test is now passing, and I'm a happy panda. So in the end, I write, this is not the most amazing code. It certainly has lots of room for improvement. But as a first pass, this would be the sort of code that one could expect. And you just simply know if n is less than 0, you get an error. If n is 0, you've got no people. If it's 1, it's one person, and so on. If you want to improve this, obviously, you'd start doing things like raising the error rather than returning, just saying return error. And you might also start testing that you actually do have an integer. And we go and we write all the tests, finish writing the tests, and suddenly I have all my tests passing. And I know at this point that it's perfectly safe to release this code out into the wild and let it go live on my production server. And it's probably not going to cause a problem. Well, it might because suddenly we might get a floating number and I haven't catered for that. But that will be an ex extension onto this code. And we have a rather fuzzy example, which also the screenshot up on the screen is quite fuzzy. This is an internal tool to help us try to figure out sometimes what is happening in our image cache. Because every single question on our website, or most of them will have an image associated with them. This image is generated in a fairly complicated way and stuck into cache. And sometimes our internal team needs to know what is sitting in that cache. So we built this quick little tool for them. And in this particular case, I didn't actually write any unit tests. I've chosen to go just with manual testing. Because it's an internal tool used only by technical people, they'll know if something's wrong, and they'll be able to describe the problem sufficiently to me. And five minutes of manual testing with this particular tool will have saved me a lot of time bothering with trying to write some unit tests to test, can it find the file, can it do other things. If, I'd going, if I was going to go and release this code out into the real world, if other users were going to use it, I would probably have stuck some unit tests in. But because it's just internal, it falls in that sort of fuzzy place where you don't necessarily have to write tests. You just have to do some form of testing with it. And then a very bad example. So another thing that we do on our website is we collect learners together into classes, into schools, into projects. So it's this layered up system. And if we just want to test the learner, it's fine. We can test that the learner's got certain properties. It comes back to testing, say, whether an animal is a bat or a gorilla or a panda. We can test those things very easily. But when we get right up to the level of project, it becomes that much harder to test. And what we find happening at this point we have to set up a fake school, a fake class, a fake learner, and some fake data for that learner. And we stop actually testing a unit of code, and we start testing our ability to write fake data. And writing fake data is not what we're really supposed to be testing unless we write in some sort of service to provide fake data to people. 
And since we're not wanting learners to go fake their identities or anything, we don't really want to test and waste our time on this. But if we don't use this fake data, we can't actually test what the project is returning. Or, for example, how many exercises were done by every single learner in this project. And so it becomes extremely difficult to figure out just how to test this sufficiently. And so you have to start thinking beyond just the simple little unit tests. So some key takeaways. There's a lot more to, unit te to testing than just TDD. TDD should be considered just one tool in your toolbox. It's not a one thing fits all. You're not going to pick it up and drill a hole in a wall, because it might be considered a hammer at that point. You also have to test your code to make good code, not because someone said you must, not because someone's sitting you down and saying, right, test. As developers, we want to be able to produce the <coughs> best possible code. We don't want to be spending our time fixing bugs. And so we write tests so we're not spending our time fixing all the bugs. And the very last thing that's very important when you start testing is to question everything. Question what people are telling you. Question the specs you've been given. Question the tests you're writing. Question the code you're writing. Question that. The test is doing exactly what you think it is, even if it means you go and break some working code to verify that the test is working. So that is all I have to say. Thank you for your time. And are there any questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you solve that final problem that you presented to us where you've got things inside things inside things and you want to just test the outside one without having to spend all your time writing fake data? You can try, so we haven't fully solved it yet. You can try mocking and stubbing or you can just go the route of writing the fake data and accepting that you're going to have all this fake data sitting around. But it's one that I'm still trying to figure out the optimal solution to. Hi, uh, thanks. So um, we we write software that largely talks to the database. Our Python layer is, I think, fairly thin. And writing tests then really become hard. So have you ha had any experience with how you test that? I mean, we can mock, but the, the database kind of does all that for us. So, so how do you, what do you suggest for those cases? So for our setup, we have a special testing database that we can write information into that is then used by the tests. And that has been the way that we've chosen to go because that allows you to set up essentially a fake database. It does still lead you that, to that problem that you're now not 100% sure that you're testing what you really think you are, but it gives you a lot more security because you can use the same methods that you use to set up your real database to set up your fake database. How I, I don't know how many people here have got stuck in the, with the problem of try of having uh, like an operating system that one has to interface with and like okay we want to mark out the operating system so let's make a mock for that and then you end up with a very complicated mock. Um, uh, any comments about that? So I haven't yet worked much with interfacing with the operating system. But from seeing some of the other tests, you do sometimes end up with very complicated mocks. And at that point, you might need to consider just what it is you're actually wanting to test. Because usually, once I start seeing a very complicated mock, then I'm start, I, need, I start questioning, what am I actually doing here? And is it really that necessary to test this thing? Or is there another way that I can verify that this is, in fact, working? Um, I have kind of an answer to that because I've done a lot of this before. Um, for mocks that are really complicated, what I tend to do is build a, the mock as a separate thing that has its own tests. And ideally, if there is a way to run tests against the real thing, like against a real file system or something, 
run the same tests against the mock <coughs> and the real thing to make sure that the behavior is similar enough for your purposes. But in a lot of cases, you just have to trust that the operating system behaves like an operating system and yep. handle the cases when it doesn't, when they happen. Yes. I'll also add to that. Um, also, look, see if there's already a library which mocks out whichever particular interface you want. I know there are libraries to, for example, pretend to be a file system, but you sort of supply your own files. And similarly for the, some of the databases, there are existing mocks that will uh, pretend to be a particular database and emulate it fairly closely. Okay, I think with Docker these days, you can just um, fire up a Docker and, and run your tests inside the Docker to, then you have the operating system to a large degree. Um, it's probably not directly related to op operating system calls, but if you have to do network calls or other kinds of I.O., you can actually just record and replay actual um, calls to external services and, and things that you need. Um, so that's a technique you can try. Um, so, y for example, if uh, you have a, a dependency on Google APIs, um, you might not always have access to Google API uh, directly, so you um, use a recording, some kind of recording tool um, to do that. Uh, any more questions? Thank you very much.